Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm April. I'm Joe. And this is Twice, Twice the, the Dice. Dice. Oh, um, like we're professionals. The wrap up edition. That's right. Or Q and A. Yeah, a little, a little, a little Q and A, a little back and forth, a little conversation. Both questions and answers. Uh, yes, yes, all, <laughs> yes, all of that. Uh, so, bas- what this is basically is this is the after party chat. Um, yeah. So this is after the session, um, coming back together and uh, and chatting about the session. Um, so this is following episode one uh, for Crown of the Oathbreaker, which we ran. Um, and now we are going to ask questions. Um, and we... This is the since this is episode one, the first time we're doing this. Um, this is usually like our, like I said, post game ritual, if you will. Um, but we invite comments and Q and A from you. Um, yeah. That, well, Q. Well, yeah, you're right. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll give the A. <laughs> I don't know. What that <laughs> you bring the Q, we'll bring the A, we'll bring the and we'll a. meet in the middle. And that's right. Things are going to get just really crazy from there. That's right. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the whole point of this. Yeah. And so if there's things that you're curious about, things you wondered about, whether it's um, why we did what we did, how how things went, how um, character felt, player felt, DM felt, wh- yeah. whatever What do you want to know? Like, let us know right. your, or, your questions, and then we'll answer them in these, uh, these Q&A wrap-up shows. Right. Or comments that you may have, or, yeah. you know, things like, you know. Anyway, let's have a conversation. Yeah, It'll yeah. all be good. Let's do it. So, that's that. We, and I have questions. I, I, then hopefully I have answers that match your questions. I can't wait. Can we, do you have questions for me as a I player? will. <laughs> I've prepared some questions I, for you. Well, that's, you know, uh, can we, you rock. Can we go back and forth? Yes. Okay, please. can I go first? Please. Okay, great. <laughs> How... <laughs> How does running a solo campaign, uh, really the the prep involved in a solo campaign, how is that different from the prep in a group campaign for you, specifically for you? Oh, okay, right. Well, yeah. Oh, wow. You're going to like jump right to to the make me think question, but that's cool. That's cool. I'm here for it. I'm here for thinking. Um, And you asked this question because I do currently run a group campaign as well as, um, as we do so often do, we run the duets for each other and I'm running both. Um, So I think um, in preparing for group versus solo, the biggest difference and almost it's like the but it, it is in fact the thing is you have more players that you're thinking about right. um and that's the the biggest part of the difference between the prep is whereas in a duet all i have to think about is one person and what's what's fun for that player what's their expectations what are they hoping for um, and then that character, you know, in terms of the world and the story and, and what's, what's building and happening. And of course, when you've got a group, then you've got to think about those players and characters in the game, in the world and with each other. And, and so there's, you know, obviously a different dynamic. Um, combat, um, combat is is also like uh, maybe a specific area. And it's not just the scaling, right? Oh, well, in one, you've got one player and then the other is you've got more. So you got to think about, you know, the scaling, the the challenge or the uh, whatnot. It's not even just that. It's when you've got one player, even though I use party NPCs um, to, to kind of hopefully, you know, add to the overall experience, um, of, of the story in the game, the camera, if you will, the focus is still on the player. So, so when you're in combat particularly, it's like kind of how does that flow? Right. Um, so that feels a little bit different. Whereas in uh, with more players and as in a group, the combat, not just again, like the scalability f- from a challenge perspective, but... <clears throat> the the camera moves more naturally from player to player to player, um, and not having to think quite as much of the focus of um, yeah NPCs can have moments, but 
but it's still about the person you know who's at who who I'm running the game for. Right. So. Makes sense. Did I pass? Yeah, no, that was okay. a great answer. Cool, cool, cool. Um, players can throw a big wrench in stuff times. Uh, okay. Stuff times. Stuff times. That's how English works. Uh, yeah, players, well, players can throw stuff it all the time. <laughs> a big wrench uh, in things at times and, uh, you know, completely derail like plans that you had for plot lines or, or things like that. Did I throw any wrenches in the first session? Yeah. Oh. Um, like unknowingly throw any wrenches. So I, I wouldn't say throw. I didn't try to throw wrenches. Let me right. see. Right, <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. No, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't say throw a wrench because I do try to really keep in my mind the plot, if you mm -hmm. will, and like thinking about a, a, a story that's that's moving and and coming together. It doesn't happen until it happens at the table. Right. Right. So until you know you as a player are are reacting, interacting, doing something. There, there is no story. So right. where the plot is going to go, you know, um, that being said, yeah, I mean, I, I totally get what you like because you do try to prepare and so you kind of think, well, it could go this way and it could go that way. And yeah, so there's probably times I definitely get in my head. I'm like, oh man, he, especially, you know, you, we've been married, what, 25 years and we've been gaming longer than that um, together. Um, so, you know, I think it's easy for me to fall into that trap of going, oh, he's totally gonna do this, right. and then you don't. And I'm like, well, well wait a minute, I planned for that. Um, so that's kind of like, the, I guess, the broad answer. Um, but uh, this last session, did you did you do anything that, um, that I went, ugh? I think that maybe the only thing was um, when we were uh, leaving Nangrath. So right at the beginning, you're there at the farmhouse. Oh, we're going to have some moments of, you know, oh, life change and starting adventure and oh, you know. Um, and I did kind of have in my, my head, oh, he's going to go around the town and visit with. And so we're at the farmhouse. We're getting ready to go. And then we were on the road. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, okay, I, w I had poignancy planned, but that's okay. That's okay. I get you. We're, we're traveling, were, you know. There were people. <laughs> so that was, a, that was, I got to tell you, that was, a, it, it was really interesting the way that happened because I think that was a, a big misunderstanding on my part because when you were first describing the opening of the session, you were like, you're on the road. Oh, and so okay. I was like, "Oh, okay, we're on the road. We're we're starting off mobile." And I and I <laughs> kind of I tried to pull, which really, you know, as a player, it's not the thing you do to say, "Well, hold on a second, can we go?" But you know, but I was like, "Can am I still at the farm? Can I get one more look at the farm before we leave?" And so I didn't think about the fact that. Well, now I could have gone around now because I thought, well, we're supposed to be on the road. There's oh. such importance to it because it's been said we are. So I got to make sure that no and, matter what, uh, I'm, <laughs> we get on the road ASAP. So it's kind of like somebody waking you up like, it's time to go. And you're okay. like, yes, let me, I got my, let's do it. And um, okay, completely okay. Completely okay. misunderstood. <laughs> right, because I get you because I said... And now you're on the road. Right. And I was meaning, I oh, we were... you're, you're just kind of like leaving. But I thought, oh, well, maybe you'll still like right. go through Nangrath and you'll like pop in the tavern and say goodbye. Right. Oh. I, I took so, on the road, man. Like we're down the road. And we're, we're down the road. Gone. And I, <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. I, I, I'm there. For, I'm there for it. Okay. Um, I have a whole bunch of these. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking over there. I got stuff I want to know. Yeah. So, okay. So, Let's do it. my question, and yeah. I'm, I'm going to start with the pretty, you know, basic. But I had a great time. <laughs> did you have fun? <laughs> I did. I had was a it real, fun? I had okay. a real, it was a real good okay. time. No, but serious, was it fun? Yeah, it was. Really okay, fun. you did have a good time. I had a good, good. time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 Um, what? As a player, right? Because mm. we've talked about this before, right? There, you're not your character. <laughs> right. We talked about this. No, but I mean, there's a difference, right? And I think as 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 a as as running the game, you know, I want both perspectives. So, as a player, mm -hmm. 
what was a h- highlight for you of the game? As a player? As a player. Like, what, oh. did, what did Joe enjoy so, or get a charge from? Yeah, so we talked, about, um, we talked about in the opening of episode one, which this is like episode 1.5, I guess, because it's the wrap-up show with the Q&A. But in episode one, we talked at the beginning about the background that we played through. Right. Right, so that we had the opportunity for, uh, for me to get to know Kel and for Kel to kind of get to know the world around him and the world that we're playing in. So it was a big highlight for me as a player to be interacting with elements that existed in the background, but they existed in a new way because time has passed. You know, Arlen, getting, getting to talk with Arlen. Is it, is it Arlen or Arlind? No, it's Arlen. Okay, because I've been a- saying Arlen, but Arlen just came out of my mouth, and I'm like, oh, I may have been no, his name No, it's A-R-L-E. All these years, yeah. I've known this kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but getting to, getting to interact with people um, in, in, a, in a new way because time has passed, and so okay. the relationships change. Also, going to the tavern in Willow Creek, going back to his old hometown, where you know where he met Layla and where they had that really beautiful festival that they went to. Y'all didn't see that; it's part of the background. Another time, uh, that where they met, or not where they met, but where they had this nice romantic moment, and getting back into that town and the vibe was so very different. You know what was different about it? Um, you know, well, so Kel goes back there. They're divorced, right? They're, her parents live there. He's concerned about running into them because he hasn't seen them since she just left. Right, and now he's having to interact with people who live in the same town that her parents live in, that know him well, that know her well, and he's like, I- I'm not prepared to answer questions about right. any of this. So it's not so much that the town has changed, it's that he, he has, has changed, changed right? right? And so he's going back as a very different, not a different person, but a person who's in a very different place. And mm-hmm. it's a place of avoidance. I think Kel's avoiding a lot of things for himself personally, a lot, he's avoiding some responsibility. He's avoiding a lot of avoiding a lot of things, and then going to this town. I mean, he he missed it so much that he. I wanted him to sit. You know, I had him sit at the window and observe right. people going by, and and it was sad for him because he wanted to go down and see everybody, but he also weirdly didn't feel welcome. He kind of exiled himself. Mm. You know, nobody did that to him. He kind of did that to himself. In kind of in his heart, he exiled himself from that place. Okay. So that was really cool as a player to get to kind of explore those feelings of the character and that environment in, in a new way. Does that surprise you? Um, and do you feel like playing through the background kind of gave <clears throat> gave that deeper connection to, as opposed to like we just, if we had just written out your, or you just written your background right. and said, oh, he's from Willow Creek, because I said, hey, there's this place that you can be from, and it's right. Willow Creek, and that's cool, man, right? And this is kind of like what it's like. Right. But actually, because we played through this session. Totally. Right. Totally. Okay. I, I, it was completely different. In fact, seeing the, uh, the uh, Herald. Yeah. Who won, like, the pie eating contest. <laughs> I, got so, I got so enthusiastic seeing Harold, and you were like, yeah, I mean, he's, he's come on, you know, he's, he's taking better care I of will himself. Be, since I will his... be honest right now in this moment. I'm like, okay, one of them is Harold, and the other one's Howard. Howard is, is the, the bar best. owner. Harold <laughs> is so his son. I can't remember. That means so much to only me, because it's I also kept, helpful. <laughs> I only remember because I kept saying Howard so many times when talking to the bartender. Um, but I got so excited as a player seeing Harold when you were like, he's come a long way since his pie eating days. You know what? I'm like, oh my God. I was so overjoyed. And I think it's, I think playing through backgrounds is, we've never done that before. And it's, it's now one of my favorite things. We're definitely going to have to do that again because it, it deeply impacted what the world felt like for me as a player and, and the way I was able to interact with it as Kel. It was really great. That's so cool. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Good. <laughs> we did that. <laughs> Good job. We did. You did that. You did that. Oh. Um, is it my turn for a question? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, da, 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 da. What drew you to Crown of the Oathbreaker? We have, y'all can see behind us, we've got, well, this is all the Wizards of the Coast stuff. You know, we've got the adventures and all these things, but there is a ton of other third-party content 
all over these bookshelves. A lot of adventures that you could have run. A I just believe in proper categorization. <laughs> so like items be gone, you know, along with like items. That's right. So. There's a lot of stuff kind of on the on the edges here. Um, including a metric ton of Kickstarters. You're like a gold star Kickstarter <laughs> person I did now. get an email from, from Kickstarter thanking me for being a, like a super backer or something, which allows me to Just participate wild. in more Kickstarter surveys <laughs> and, um, right. and, and, and participate do, more and do Kickstarter. more Kickstarters. <laughs> yeah. so what, but what drew you to Crown of the Oathbreaker? Out of everything that we have, you, you went with this brand new... Huge, huge campaign. 916 pages. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my favorite genre, um, I love epic fantasy, mm -hmm. high fantasy. Um, I like big magic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can we please have a wizard at some point that does some serious <laughs> evocation? He's magic. like, I like big magic. Yeah, we're bringing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Dr. Magic. Um, yes. Oh my God. Please make Dr. Magic. Right. An he can be good friend with Dr. Alchemy. Yes. Um, you know why? Cause that's alchemy, baby. baby. And that's magic, baby. <laughs> <laughs> what? Did we just become best friends? So sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, 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 Crowd of the Oathbreaker. So, um, yeah, Count of the Oathbreaker um, is, it's this massive tome. And I think when I was first talking to you about it, I, I made the joke and I didn't mean it in any kind of like negative way. I was just totally, totally serious and awesome. It's like, when you read through this adventure, it's, they threw everything and then, and then the kitchen sink to it. But it's fantastic because it's just adds more, as you go through the adventure, it's just one more layer of this, this, and then this, and then this, and then it gets bigger. And, um, I, you know, the, the way that it was brought together as this, this, this survey where they had several thousand responses right. and it was this really extensive survey of asking all the questions about, you know, um, how long do you, everything from play styles, like how long do your sessions usually last and um, to what kind of uh, settings do you like? Do you like going to the you know, the Feywild? Do you like going to dungeons? How do you feel about manticores? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was a question, right? But it, it, there, it did have questions like, what are your favorite, you know, what, what's your favorite types of villains to fight? What, what types of villains do you like to fight when you're only fighting one villain? What do we do? You're going to fight groups of them. You know, like all these questions. But yeah, I mean, I really think that was what it was. It is this epic, dark, fantasy, um, very, um, and, and they pull in uh, this whole um, grand operatic, you know, Shakespearean, I don't know if that's it's, the right it's thing. It's a massive campaign. Yeah, it's just this massive campaign and it has all these absolutely total cool elements and I'm not giving justice to it about <laughs> the abs absolute, um, uh, uh, I just keep saying absolute and massive, I think is what I've repeated over and over. But that, that really was what it was because it, it, it hit those vibes of what I like so much about give me, give me more power. No, give me bigger and, and everything when it comes to the fantasy, when it comes to the magic, when it comes to the dark, when it comes to why would you go to one realm when you can go to five, you know, that kind of thing. So well, yeah, it's, it's insane and I love it. Well, and it's it's wild to me because one of the campaigns, another campaign that you recently ran, mm -hmm. was Odyssey of the Dragon Lords. Yes, which was also a kick, also a Kickstarter. <laughs> I like Kickstarter. It's and a great time to be into it, tabletop RPGs. It is a RPGs. very good time to be on this uh, which was another just massive, sprawling, epic campaign, and. It, you created so many incredible moments with that from things that you found within the community that were in the book to things that you came up with that you added to it. And uh, I, I said in the opening that I'm very excited to see kind of what you do with this because really it is going to be completely unique. I think oh, everybody yeah, who runs sure. it. That always surprised me. When I've watched actual plays and we're like, oh, they ran the same thing that we did. Let's see how it goes. And it starts completely different. <laughs> you're like, wait, wait a minute, is this all homebrew? Like how'd you, you know. So uh, I can't wait. Yeah. to see where it goes. And I'm really glad you, you chose it. 
Oh, well, we, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited you wanted to come on this journey with me. We're excited you wanted to come on this yeah. journey with us. Um, Maybe yeah. you can be Mr. Magic. <laughs> I love this character. We, we, uh, Anyway, Uh-oh. we won't get into it. Okay. We'll talk. We'll, we'll do we'll just. Yeah. Um, you said something there uh, that I just wanted to like tag on real quick, yeah. uh, if I may. Yeah. Um, so talking about homebrew, because we, we've, we for me, my idea of homebrew is probably not what maybe others are. Um for a homebrew, for a lot of people, they create their own settings. They want to create massive adventures and link them all together into these, you know, humongo campaigns and whatnot. And I am so blessed and fortunate to live in a world with people and people who are passionate and creative and have all this amazing talent that I can then grab and 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 latch onto. Um, I'm not a world builder uh, from the standpoint of that, you know, creating a setting of my own or, you know, so I love published material. Um, and I, I love being able to grab encounters and adventures and campaign settings and all that kind of stuff. And to me, where my homebrew comes is what happens at the table with the player and the, and the bringing the customization. I'm more of a configurer. <laughs> <laughs> than than a creator, um, because that's that's where the homebrew is. Is is it's you know what about this? Is the player going to do? How are they going to react? Right. How are they going to interact? Right. How are they going to take this material? And then together we're going to create something yeah. like you said that's completely unique and new. Um, and so it's it's really exciting to see what you're going to do with this. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to see you too. I think uh, I think we came up with. Uh, it was a great start, and the, I think the, the partnership through playing through the background was amazing. You're a really good partner. You are a really good partner, boo. And uh, yeah, oh, you have a question? Do you have questions for me? I do. Because I, I definitely have a list, and we can certainly keep going. Okay, so I asked the question about um, what was the moment for Joe. Right. What was the moment, and I won't necessarily say, again, it's not the, when I say highlight, Right. Not like what well, was fun, <laughs> but was there a moment in this session, in this first session, for Kel that really... As weird as it, as it is to say, and we're going to talk about the manticore, but okay. I, <laughs> sure. I think the biggest moment for him was the same, what was part of what was such a big moment for me, I think it was for him going to Willow Creek and knowing that they have to be there and having to go through all of that was really, was really tough for him. That was, that was really big. More than, you know, hunting down the manticore or anything like that, it was having to be in this town around these people. That was really, really big for him. And, and leaving the farm, I think leaving the farm is so significant. And yes. that place almost represents failure to him, but it, it also represents something that he was not able to just work his way through. You know, you can, you, you can, you can work at something and work at something and work at something and come away often with something. And all the kind of blood and sweat that he put into that place, it brought nothing but to him because this is where he is as a character right now. It's, it's heartache and loss right. and failure and all of these things. And so, you know, there's that, there's that mentality of, look, you haven't failed until you give up. And selling the farm felt to him like giving up. So he hasn't acknowledged kind of the greater point of that yet. He okay. still sees it as, as, as an absolute failure. And, was, and that was hard, it was very hard to walk away. Was there any relief for him in it? I think the, the relief for Kel in that moment was he's got something else that he has to focus on. And kind of like how you, someone will go just 
bury themselves in their work so they don't have to deal with some other issues, he's sort of doing that. This place isn't sustainable. We've got to get on the road. We've got to head over to Onad Beer. You know, we're doing, and we're also doing this delivery. So that's why he was like, all right, let me show you how this works. You want to make sure this is da 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 da. -da. He's, you know, what's the next task at hand? What's the next thing? Because when he when he stops moving and when he sits still, the only thing he sees is is what he's not doing right, what's not going right, and where he has dropped the ball. And so it's really hard for him to be still. And having to be in Willow Creek for two nights in a row right. is awful. <laughs> that is really, really awful. Um, yeah. Right. So is that weird to hear that the big points for him were leaving the farm and get going into Willow Creek? No. Oh, and in case anybody's wondering why I keep reaching it, our dog is yeah, under the table, is and she she is She's, very hey, she okay. she suddenly decided that it is time <laughs> to become part of this conversation. Hi, so, um, hope okay. y'all like dogs. Yeah, when the others are on the way. Okay, girl. Okay. Yeah, let's get it. I'm not yeah. sure what she's fussy about. Uh, she's or she just, just wants excited. attention. She just wants some. Yeah, she wants it's some okay. Love. I get you. It's okay. I we get do. you. We all we want do. attention sometimes. Uh, I have other questions for you. Are you ready? I'm trying to be. Do you find it hard not to talk about plot with me? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, <laughs> Gabby, do you find it hard? <laughs> She's like, I will talk to you. I'll I will. talk about plot. <laughs> I talk about plot all the time. No, I mean, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 um, I was about to say, I want to talk. And obviously that didn't, um, my attempt to make words right then. <laughs> words, words are hard. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's really, <laughs> there's not like a bigger answer to that. <laughs> it's just yes. Yeah, yeah. I know, and right. That's fine, that's a great answer. You can, you, can, you can ask away, you can fire away. Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, so, um, so my question is the dream. The dream. The dream from the background or the dream from? No, the, we're talking about the session. We're talking about the session, yeah, right. Yeah, um, but there was the dream in the background. And this, as yeah. well. So I mean, if, the, if there's something that we should, relates we should to say for for people who may not know, Kel had a very prophetic dream uh, in the background that came true, and some of the same elements that were in the dream that we saw in episode one were present in the uh, in the background episodes that we did. And uh, what's the question? Sorry, I was clarifying. I don't remember what the question was. Like, how <laughs> I don't did, know. How did I, you, I didn't think I got, I don't, I got I don't to think the question. You got to the question. Yeah. No, I think I just went. The dream, the like dream. that was the question, <laughs> um, but it, it kind of is. So right. um, in the in the dream, because I don't want to assume, right? So Kel reacted to the figure that then revealed itself to be Kel himself, right? Right. But his initial reaction was to run charging and say, you know, I don't, want I don't this. want this. Yeah. So tell me about that. I think that when he, when he, I mean, the first thing that happened when he, well, anyway, I think when, when he was having the dream, it feels like something that is forced on him. All of this feels very forced on him. Right. Kel does really well with things that he feels like he can control. Um, he can, it, I think even in the background, when I was looking at backgrounds for him, I found this, uh, the caravan master, the wagon master mm -hmm. kind of, and I was like, oh, what a kind of a fun thing. Like he knows the roads and we came up with this whole thing with him and his dad and they worked together. But like one of the, um, one of the flaws in there is, or one of the bonds or something like that is uh, early to bed, early to rise, this at least I can control. Right. Okay. And I was like, wow, what a great thing for, for him to, with all of his issues and the stuff sure. that we baked in. And so this is something that he can't control. He, he feels powerless to himself and himself. He's like, I am the thing that I should have the most control over. And he doesn't, right. you know, being able to lay hands when he healed himself, you know, right. for the first time. And he was like, like, what is that? Um, all of these things. And of course, now being able to kind of call on that anger and that fury. And of course, you know, he's divine smiting things. Um, so he, he doesn't understand it. There are no answers. 
And he doesn't like that. He doesn't like that it's vague. He doesn't like that he doesn't understand it. And plus the connection with his mother, with the ring, with the black and white. Right. And the, the, so that's, it, that all frustrates him and angers him. And he's like, I'm not asking for this. And I'm telling you, I don't want it. And yet at the same time, he's using it. Right. You know, he uses it to, to take- Because it's a tool. Because it's a tool, right. So he's using it to like take down- I, I'm not phones. trying to like- No, you're, no, you're 100% that. right because it's a tool. He's like, well, this is something I can do. I'm going to do it. But of course, in his mind, he's like, if I didn't have this, I wouldn't, but I have it. So I might as well use it. But when confronted with what he thought was the source of it, right. he was like, I'm going to let you know right now. And of course, then it turned out to be him. So is it okay if I ask then- Two, two, it's a two-parter. Sure, yeah. And it's still, still on this. I like this. Two-parters. <laughs> if he does think about what the source is, mm -hmm. you know, assuming that he even lets his mind go there, right. what does he, does he have any thoughts on what the source of his power is? I think he thinks it's connected to his mother. I think he thinks it's, it's definitely at this point connected to something divine. Okay. Um, I, I don't think he's, he's not blind to kind of the symbolism and the potential in the symbolism. Um, it definitely to him, he, he believes it's something divine, but he also sees, he's one of those folks that sees that as a lot of trouble. Right. You know, he has a hard distrust of organizations, of groups, of people, and enigmatic figures that he does not know. Is that because of his mother being... A, oh, a big part of it. Imprisoned. Yeah, okay. his, his mother being imprisoned, the whole thing with the king, like all of that stuff, I, I think to him is, there's a huge amount of distrust right. there. And when, of course, he sees in his vision, which I had no idea. I mean, I, I, didn't, I don't know any of the stuff that's going to happen because... You know, April's not going to tell me any anything. That's that's. I'm very that's, <laughs> The only thing I know is what I know. Look, people only know what they know. Yeah, that's become one of our favorite phrases. Um, but when it whipped around and it was Kel, I think it it totally rocked his world. I didn't see it coming as a player. And like on the one hand, how do you not? <laughs> see that coming like I'm thinking about like Star Wars I'm thinking about like all these like moments where it's like the thing in the dream turns out to be you what a great trope and you you pulled it off in such a way that I had no clue that was going to happen really okay no cool. clue when 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 I, I kept thinking as a player the whole time number one I'm thinking don't think about this just do whatever, you know, kind of the route that the character would go. It's not my job as a player to figure out who this is. It's my job to portray what the character would do in this right. situation, right? In line with the game and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, but when I, when I did find myself thinking about it, I was like, oh, I'll bet it's his mom. Oh, I'll bet it's like a, a divine being. Oh, I'll bet it's like, a, a king or some priest or some or just some like enigmatic figure that he hasn't met that's going to be like the voice behind because obviously if you've watched episode 1 you know that Kel is a paladin um he has already exhibited some of the abilities of his um oh what is it called it's features of his, his class yeah features of right his channel divinity right he's an oath of conquest paladin um and so I thought it was going to be something connected to all that. I had no clue it was going to be him. And of course, seeing what he did, that just angered him even more to be told, you're going to do this or you're going to be this. And he's like, I haven't chosen any of that. Right. And I'm, I'm not going to be railroaded into being something. Because he also, <laughs> which, which he is, right? But he also, he hasn't figured out what he's supposed to be right now. Right. And on the one hand, Kel, Kel's a, a pretty filled out character and, and I, I feel very confident with making choices you know, for the character that are complex choices. Um, but he's still really in a dark place trying to figure himself out. And then all of a sudden to have what he feels this is thrust on him and honestly has been haunting him right. for a very long time. So it was, it was super great. I should say that was a huge moment. I mentioned like Nangrath and that. <laughs> the dream was massive, just massive. Well, okay. But, and before you go, I, one rule, the, okay. the 
two part of the two parter. Oh, I thought that was the two part. No, no, no. no. Well, we touched the first one. Two point five. <laughs> <laughs> I love these point fives. Go ahead, go ahead. Was when the figure turns around mm-hmm. and it's Kel mm-hmm. confronting Kel. What was Kel's first reaction to that? I think he was. I think he was stunned. Just stunned. I mean, he woke up in that moment. Um, but if the scene had continued to play out and he stayed in the dream, I think he would have, you know, he would have dropped his axe. He would have stumbled back um, before pausing a second and then picking it back up. Um, I, I don't know what he would have done because that didn't happen. Well, I, and and I'm not so much like what action he would, but what did he what did he feel in that moment? Was I think it, he, I think he know, was I was think it he was fear. Was it anger? Was no, I think it just was, I, I think don't even know what to was, do with it. I think at first it was fear mm-hmm. initially because there's a, a lack of understanding and being shown. You know, hey, here's a picture of you ten years down the road, and you're like, why? You know, right? Why did I dye my beard purple and I'm dressed in a top hat? And you know, like, what is going on? Like, you're like, that's not me. And so that's the kind of reaction that he had was like, that's not me. Why are you showing me this? Because he feels forced. Okay. You know, something's forced upon him. Um, so yeah, I think it went went from fear to anger very quickly. Which you know, it tends to be the route that he takes. You know, right. he goes to that pretty fast. Yeah. Pretty fast. Um, are you ready? Yes. Okay, this is my last question that I have because I, I switched up the, uh, the order I intended originally. Oh. Uh, did you feel uncomfortable about the manticore getting cut down while it was trapped? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. You know, so the manticore being there, right? Um, <clears throat> I thought about a couple of different ways that that encounter could go. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, the, the, that could, it could be like a two-part threat thing, which it, it was from a presence, but an sure. actual, from a combat, you know, like first you have to fight the Edder Cap, and then once that happens, and then the, you know, Manticore is breaking through, and then it breaks through, and now you got to fight the Manticore. Yeah, I was so worried that thing was going to get loose the whole time. I was like, we've got to tear down this Edder Cap as quick as possible, because that thing is coming. And that was the route that I decided I more wanted the encounter to play was the manticore is there. There's this thread of it that kind of drives, you know, the the urgency and tension around fighting the, while you're fighting the Edder Cap, right. of like what's going to happen. Um, but um, the real part of that was the manticore was trapped. It couldn't get out. So it became then hey, here's this monstrosity beast, typically known to be evil, flesh-eating, man-eating. Um, and metal-eating. And, and metal-eating, iron, yeah, this is true. Um, so, uh, and what are you gonna do? Do you leave it there? Do you free it? Do you kill it, what right. happened. And so right. the choice to that I thought it would be mm-hmm. more interesting for you as a player um, to go through that with, especially Kel, where he is on his journey. Um, so I left it there as kind of like a, a moral dilemma. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> Yay! This is where we get to admit the things that happen at the table when you're running, <laughs> and for whatever reason, you don't do things as planned. What was what was the thing? Um, so manticores can talk, <laughs> and we had already demonstrated yeah. that the manticore right. was capable because it had been roaring throughout the encounter. Um, and for whatever reason, when it got to that point of, okay, you've defeated the intercap, now we have to figure out what to do with the manticore. Right. And I, I don't know what, my brain literally just went, um, because you didn't talk to the manticore, therefore it didn't <laughs> talk to you, as opposed to me having the manticore say something, um, so I think right. I just decided in my head canon after was that, well, this manticore couldn't talk. He never 
I don't know right, why, but right. like he wasn't that type of manicure. He wasn't talking manicure. He's, I don't know. He's not that kind of He's manicure. not that kind of manicure. Look, <laughs> he's just... He's not into it. Yeah, but so to answer your question about, um, but it, was, it, was it difficult? Yes, because like I think you were even saying it in the session, uh, Joe is really struggling with this because yeah. it, it doesn't feel right. I did. I had, such, I had a yeah. really hard time with that. I mean, on the one hand, manticore, right? This thing is going to get out and it's going to go right back to hurting people. We right. have to stop this thing. But it was trapped and helpless and all of this stuff. So I felt very conflicted. You know, it's kind of like that moment where like you can know what the right thing to do is even if it doesn't necessarily, you're like, this is the really hard thing to do. Go ahead. So let me ask. So you had said during the session that Kel's like initial reaction was burn it. Yeah. You know, because he's just, that's the way he is. But then he kind of very quickly flipped. So I can ask a two-parter. Yeah. One, did your reaction as Joe influence Kel's? Uh, and then the other part of it is... Uh, or and, and and that's kind of like its own separate sure. question. Um, and then the other one is, but when Kel did change, what was the main re, what was yeah. the driver no, a, for why he that's changed? That's a great that? question. For you know, me as a player, I see as one of my big jobs is to be a participant in the story, not to go. Let's just see what I can do. You know what I mean? I, I like I have, I have I have interest in that, but I want to go. Let me see what I can do within the story to help with the story that we're telling in a way that makes sense, not just like, you know, I, I just want to, you know, start a, you know, what's the, the phrase we always like, well, I just want to start a goat farm, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go do the adventure. Nothing against I'd anyone like to, who wants listen, to start goat farms. I'm farm. all for goat that... farms. That sounds super awesome. I had a thief one time that wanted to run a side business making puzzle boxes, and I was so invested <laughs> in, like, what kind of shop he had and all that. So, I mean, I, I get it, but I don't want to make choices that are intentionally just, let's see what happens. I want right. to make choices that make sense for the character. I feel like that's part of my job as a player in a way that doesn't derail what's happening, right? I like following hooks, but I like following them in a way that makes sense for the character. So sure. when it came to the issue with the, uh, with the Manticore, I felt troubled by it just because of the situation itself. But I thought about, well, what would Kel do? And Kel's response to it is, like you said, his first reaction was burn it. This is an evil creature. You know, I thought about his oath and why he has that, why he's down that path, why that makes sense to him. This is something that if we let it go, what's the option? We're gonna trap it and we're gonna send it away. It's right. gonna get out and terrorize people over there. No, the only way to stop this thing is to douse the flame of hope, you know, is to, is to get rid of it. And then if you really wanna go a step further, if he was gonna truly like full on right. oath of conquest, it's find its layer right. and get rid of whatever's in there. I mean, he wasn't thinking about they even have layers. He doesn't know that. But he was like, burn it. And then when he said that out loud, the cruelty of that hit him. And that's why he, and, and so that wasn't Joe as the player saying, wait, stop. That was him as the character saying, wait, wait, stop. We don't need to cause this thing undue harm. And so it was a real moment for him also acknowledging that his first reaction was burn this thing down. And then he was like, that's not necessary. We can still do what we need to do, achieve the same result without submitting to being cruel. This is not the place for that. And what's, what's interesting is that Kel does see that there's a place for that. You know, if, if, he, if it was like a band of, you know, terrible monsters or whatever, and... They, he has to defeat one of them to convince the rest of them to go away. He's going to defeat that one in the harshest way possible to end the conflict right. so that they'll you know, retreat and, and to cause fear. But he's like, there's no reason to submit to cruelty. You know, we can just do this. So it was an interesting moment having to make that decision as a character. Okay. As a player, I was like, I hate this whole situation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, okay. I so, love it, but I don't. Um, so you said the moment when Kel was like, burn it, and then he went, wait, right. no, need to, no need for cruelty and, and right. inflicting undue pain, right. um, that it had an impact on him. So what was the, the impact, the feeling to him? Did he... Did he have a moment of relief that he was like, oh, thank God, I'm not actually as far gone as I think, 
I, I am or was there uh, or was there I'm not going to keep leading the witness. No, no, no. You, just, you, you said that it, it had it was an yeah. impact to him to have that kind of that flip. Right. So I don't think that he had a record. I don't want to say like a like a whole too far gone kind of moment. He didn't have that, but he did. He did acknowledge that that's the first place his, his mind went. Right. I mean, the places that they were at before. You know, they're in Nangrath when Fort Black Bell when they found that there was whatever happened to be in there. I mean, we, don't, we didn't, uh, that was part of the background that passed, time passed over that, right? They went back, they cleared out all the monsters that were in there. And those things were a huge threat to the town. And he, and, and he, he didn't love Nangrath. Nangrath was fine, but that was a place steeped in misery for him. And it wasn't Nangrath's fault, by the way. Also, most of the things that Kel sees as sources of misery are his own doing. Um, but he, <laughs> right, and isn't that just the way it is? But Nangrath was not a happy place for him, but there were people there. And people deserved to live lives without fear. And he, he hates that. I think if there's something that Kel would, would attribute the word, like put the word hate on, when people are having to live in fear because of something awful that looms over them, when there's a shadow over them, he, he wants to go beat that back until he has no strength left. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a point of furious anger for him. Um, he, he hates that. And so when Arlen was in danger in Fort Blackbell and there was that hag spawn, I had never run into a hag spawn before. That was the first time. It was very cool. Also, edder caps, never fought an edder cap. So when the hag spawn thing happened and all this stuff, and it's right in their back, right, right, right you know, next door at Fort Blackbell, that, that was a big moment for him. And then, of course, this manticore, so close to Willow Creek. Right. A town that is associated, that he, he, feels uncomfortable being in Willow Creek because he also sees that he is a source of misery. You huh. know, he causes misery. That's what he sees. I ruined this farm. I ruined my marriage. I have ruined my relationships with people I had a chance to be around. He sees himself, I think, deep down as he just, he just ruins things and that that's what he's good at. And so going to Willow Creek, which he didn't want to be there just because he doesn't want to have to be around that place. And then seeing this manticore so close to a place that he truly loves, that's why he went to burn it. That's really... Absolutely burn it. That's really, um, I think, interesting that you said that the part of his discomfort in being Willow, in Willow Creek is that he feels like he's bringing... Oh, like darkness, or yeah. it's probably a little melodramatic, but it, like it's he, not. Like he's though. I think it's misery there. It's accurate. I think it's yeah. very accurate. This is this is this good place, and by it's it's made not as it's made not as good just by him his right. presence. I, I I married this incredible person from here. We had this great thing, and I completely ruined that and she left and now he's also sold off the property that was inherited by her so he failed the family like all these things that he sees as just really bad bad things and then here he is coming to this town as a representative of all those things that he that he hates wow yeah okay and that does it for this week's therapy session. On that <laughs> <laughs> Gaming like life. <laughs> um, okay. Did you have any other questions for me then? Or I, I didn't. That's I didn't. Gonna, no, okay. that's it. That's it for now. All right. Then um, I have just, I think, a couple more for you. Oh. If that's kosher. Sure, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Super. Super um, kosher. So um, for Kel. Yes. What are his immediate goals? Well, he loves ice cream. Uh, it, no, his uh, immediate goals. Long walks. Is, <laughs> he likes pineapples. No, Kel loves, um, I was about to go into his likes and dislikes. Kel wants to 
get out of Willow Creek as soon as possible. <laughs> okay, fair. Um, he wants to get to Onad Beer and he wants to find um, Sign because he, especially after this last dream, right? He's like, I need answers. Okay. This is what's happening. This is what's going on. This is what happened in Black Bell. And he, he, he's looking forward to having that conversation and getting answers. He's not looking forward to being around Sign, even though Sign has done nothing wrong. You know, but Sine was there when his father died. He relieved his father of some pain, which was good, but he also knew things. Right. And Kel was like, in addition to the stuff that he wants to know about what's going on with him, he also wants to know why didn't you do anything? What did you do, if anything? Right. You know, about his mom, about all this. So he's got like lots of questions for Sign, and he, he wants to get some answers. If nothing else, he wants to get started on a path that will give him some answers. He wants to see Brock, you know, he wants to see Carrie, um, and he wants to, uh, yeah, that's it. He wants to visit his two friends, and he wants to get some answers from Sign. What does he want for Arlen? That's a great question. I think that, I say it's a great question because I, I have almost no answer. I think that- Anything <laughs> that makes us think. I think that what he wants to do, I think what he wants to see, what's interesting, I'm sitting here thinking about what the character thinks about that and his thought is, this is what I'm gonna do for Arlen. He, he wants to give Arlen enough support so that he can make the decision on whether he's gonna stay or go. You know, he's now been out of Nangrath, which he's never done. He's seen Willow Creek. He's learning about this. They've done, they haven't really done adventuring, but they did. They went and cleared out Fort Blackbell and Arlen came with him. So he's not like, you know, it's not like when you, when you, when you run a campaign and you plan a campaign, you're thinking about the party a lot, right? Oh, the party, the party. And it's, it's interesting in a solo because I don't think about the party, right? I do as a player with other players. But in a solo campaign, I don't think about that. So you may have characters that you form a relationship with that, yeah, Arlen's in the party, but I don't think about Arlen being in the party. He's like, I want to get him to Onod Beer. That'll open up a world of opportunities there for him. He can go do whatever he wants to do. My job, you know, Kel's job is to get him there safely, show him some stuff on the way. And I think I did, did right by him getting, out of, getting him out of his father's house and giving him his own place. And now he can go do whatever he's going to do. You know, so he wants to get him to own on beer. And, uh, and then what he does from there is up to him. Okay, so I'd, I have another question now. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm curious. If you're asking me as a player, do I want Arlen to stay in the party? I think Arlen's great. I, I would love that. But I think Kel very much sees it as, that's not, you know, I can't pay you. I don't have a place for you to stay anymore. It, you know, it, you want to sleep in the caravan? I'm going to sleep in the wagon. Right. <laughs> you know, I got a tent you can sleep next to the wagon, you know, but I don't have a place for you anymore. And, right. and this, this relationship of kind of bringing you on to help, that was to help on the farm and you had a place to stay. That, that's done. Right. As of right now, I'm just showing you some things and getting you to the next place safely. And is that also driven by the fact that Kel just doesn't think that he has anything to offer if he doesn't, if he's not giving Kel, he wasn't, you know, because he, he did give him a place to stay. He gave mm -hmm. him a job and stuff. So right. it was like, I had something to offer you then. Right. But if all Kel has to offer is himself, since he's now a drifter, you know. Yeah, I mean, and also, is, is, is that I don't know, you know, as a player, I have no clue what's going to happen when you get to, when we get to Onod Beer, right? Anything could happen. Red light on. Oh, no, we're good. Anything could happen when we get to Onod Beer. Mm -hmm. um, Kel's thought is, I'm going to go talk to Sign, and then I'm going to start picking up jobs. Right. So if Arlen wants to stay on and learn how to work a caravan, I can always use the help. Two people sure make this a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Hi, Balder. And that would be great, but that's going to be up to him. Right. I mean, that's, that's his thought. Yeah, okay. The only thing I had to offer him is employment if I can find other work. Right. And if he wants that to be his work. Okay, cool. All right, so <laughs> he wants to talk to Sign. Right. He wants to see Beck. He wants to see Carrie. Right. And, um, 
and he wants to... I think that's our cue. We're being told that we've talked long enough Way too and long. we have not considered other opinion. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we're being summoned, that's apparently. Right. That's right. But um, cool. No, thanks for... Thanks for the chat. Yeah. I really appreciated it. Thanks for the chat yourself. Yeah, it was... Had it a was, great time. <laughs> we should do this so again. So cool. We should talk again sometime. <laughs> Maybe I'll come to your house. That's you can right. come to mine. Sweet. Cool, cool, cool. By the way, in case anybody doesn't know, when we, when we were doing the session, I'm sitting right over there where the camera is, and uh, and that side has all, all of our uh, World of Darkness books and stuff on oh, it. I don't know why that felt that was necessary to say, but... There's a lot of... World there's a lot of, of World of Darkness books. A lot of books. We played a lot of Werewolf and Vampire back in the day. <laughs> and, and that's really what it was. We would just sit on opposite Aside. sides and go. Uh. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for checking this out. Thank you for being here for this Q and A. Thanks for checking out the first episode. If you haven't seen it yet, please go check that out. Subscribe, like, comment, share the bell, the, all the things so you can know when we go live, which is quite often. Episode two is coming up really soon. We're gonna find out what happens. What's gonna happen? She knows. I have no clue. But we're gonna we're, we'll get <laughs> oh, there together. Ye, oh, ye of, <laughs> of great faith and strong assumptions. <laughs> and if you have questions that you would like to see answered about anything that happened during a session or about how we run games or just really anything in, in general, please feel free to put those in the comment section. We're happy to answer those. And it'll give us something to talk about on the next Q&A. Although I feel like there will be a lot to talk about just in the episode, questions we'll have for each other. But we want to include your <laughs> questions as well. Please make sure and ask them. And uh, yeah, thanks a bunch. Awesome. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us again. Um, we've enjoyed this. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right. Y'all take care. Bye. Bye.